So thanks for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, it truly is a pleasure um, to, to do this. And, you know, my sponsor always says when someone asked it, you know, then you should say yes. And um, I, um, I am 56 years young. I have 23-year-old twin boys and a 21-year-old daughter. They all live with me here because they're going to school. It's very expensive to live here in Charlotte. Um, and um, great relationship with my children um, now. My sobriety date is December the 15th of 2020. Um, I was at Pavilion in January, February of 20 of 21. And um, I also have another date that's coming up I'm celebrating um, is February 9th of um, 2022. I had a liver transplant. And so I um, have been given the gift of life. And so every day that I'm here and have the opportunity to talk about my story and, um, you know, and how God gave me a second chance, um, I will say yes. So, um Let's see, um, a little bit of background. Um, so I grew up in, in um, I would say, upper middle class family. Um, my uh, mom uh, was a CEO of a defense company. Um, her company um, designed and developed the Comanche helicopter, which had missiles on it. So you only, only, only have one um, customer, and that would be the U.S. government. <laughs> so we moved quite a bit growing up. Um, longest I probably stayed was three years, four years. Um, so, uh, my siblings were my best friends. My brother is 15 months younger than I am. And, um, my sister is five years younger. So, um, we were very close knit. Um, the, um, you know, I was very proud of my mom, um, for her accomplishments. Um, but at the same time, she was an absent mom. Um, she worked many, many hours. Um, it was very rare that I saw her. Um, if, if I did see her, she usually went to work before I got up. And, um, if she did come home, um, she, it was, it was late at night and it was to go to work. And so, um, I missed her. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the one thing that I did, um, uh, and, you know, uh, enjoy was my birthday every year. And my mom made it special every single year of my birthday. We went to New York City and um, we went to see the tree in Rockefeller Center. My birthday is December 20th. And um, we went shopping and, um, you know, ice skating. We cannot ice skate. And we laughed and it was it was wonderful. Um, my dad also worked um, full time. Um, obviously, he had to pick up jobs um, as as my mom changed. And he, they made that decision a long time ago. They met they were high school sweethearts um, and met um, in Statesville, North Carolina. So. Um, and he did that. So he was kind of a Mr. Mom. A lot of the times he was home and, um, he would go and sit in the kindergarten class. My dad was a big man. He was, um, oh, six foot eight. Um, so big guy in little tiny chairs. And, um, my dad, um, terrible cook. Um, <laughs> so I had to learn how to cook. Um, he made some very interesting casseroles that we learned to stomach. Um, <laughs> but, um, very jovial person, um, very outgoing. Um, there isn't a person he couldn't talk to. Um, and, um, you know, but the thing is, is that, um, he shares the same addiction that I have. And my dad's an alcoholic. And um, when my dad drinks, um, he's not a very nice man. Mm, my dad is what I call a rageaholic, too. And um, he turned into um, a person that, um, you know, would yell and scream and um, at times did get violent. Um, he um, they had high expectations for us. We were always taught, you know, um, work hard. You know, if you can read, you can do anything. Um, pull up your bootstraps. Um, you know, you've got this. Do it on your own. You, you know, it wasn't progress, you know, not perfection. It was perfection. And um, and if we did not have perfection, my dad would get upset. And, um, and so there were many instances where it, it was pretty scary. Um, and I think that's a big part of why my mom also worked a lot too. Um, she was afraid of him. Um, and so my, um, brother and sister and I, we became kind of a team. Um, what we learned is, um, when dad gets mad, you go and hide, you know, and, um, and that's what we would do. And, and we would just, um, make dad happy. And, um, 
you know, um, and everything's going to be okay. And um, it's not to say that we didn't do a lot of good things. We did. Um, um, our house, um, we went on wonderful vacations growing up. Um, my mom loved the holidays. My dad adored my mother. Um, he gave her everything that she could possibly want. And all she actually ever wanted was, um, you know, really just, um, she loved to cook and she liked the simple things in life, like one little flower or thing. He liked to give her jewelry. She didn't really want that, whatever. Um, but, um, she loved the holidays. And so my dad would go and we go get the biggest tree we could find. And it would come on a tractor trailer. I mean, we, I mean it had to be 30 feet or higher. <clears throat> And, um, you know, and so those were times when I saw my mom was the holidays. So I love the holidays. I live for my birthday and I lived for the holidays because I got to see her and, and I felt protected when she was around. And, um, so, you know, um, so those were good times and she threw elaborate parties, um, and she taught me how to cook and she was an amazing cook and we met great people. I mean, they, I mean, five-star generals. Um, I got to meet Condoleezza Rice and, and both pre Bush presidents and Henry Kissinger. I mean, amazing people in our homes. I didn't know who they were. I didn't really care. <laughs> um, all I knew is they were big people and they were actually really nice. They told really funny stories, you know? And, um, so, but, um, you know, so there were, there were a lot of good times. Um, but the one thing that I always tried to do was to try to get my mom's attention. And what I thought was, well, if she would be proud of me, then maybe she'd stay home. So I, you know, was a good student. And so, um, you know, I always studied hard and also because I didn't want to get in trouble with my dad. But, you know, my high school graduation, uh, my mom was too busy to come to my high school graduation. My dad showed up drunk. You know, I'm giving the speech and my dad's over there carrying on. And, you know, um, I wanted to crawl under the podium, you know, um, my college graduation, same sort of thing. I'm like, OK, well, maybe she'll come to the next one. I graduated top of my class in college um, and um, <clears throat> she didn't come to that either. I got a nice set of luggage. Um, she was busy. Um, and, um, my dad and, and mom did show up for the, you know, kind of the after party and whatnot. And, and I said, that's okay. That's okay. But it was a lie inside. I felt like there was a hole inside of me. I felt lonely growing up and I felt like, I'm like, what's wrong with me? There's gotta be something wrong with me. You know, I, am I good enough? How good is good enough? I didn't know how good is, I didn't know. Um, so you know, after college, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I graduated with biochemistry and opera. And I'm like, well, I didn't want to go into biochemistry because all those people were nerds. I was too. <laughs> but um, one thing about growing up is we were taught about art and music and philosophy and whatnot. So it's very interesting. And I thought those people were boring. And music, I didn't know too many um, people that made it as an opera singer. So I thought, well, okay. Um, but I knew how to cook and I love to cook and I love to entertain. So I thought I'll go to culinary school. So I went to culinary school. Uh, I went to the um, Hyde Park to the Culinary Institute. And I graduated from there. And I thought I'd come home and I'd share these things with my mom. And, you know, she thought it was interesting. And, you know, she's like, well, the best chefs go to Le Cordon Bleu in France, you know. And I'm like, well, then I'm going to go there because <laughs> that'll make her proud. And so she kind of pulled some strings and new people. And so I went to, to Paris and studied uh, there for a couple of years. And, um, you know, it, and that was probably the first time I was introduced. I mean, I saw alcohol growing, you know. But I mean, obviously, I didn't want anything to do with alcohol because I saw what it did to, did to personalities. And um, I also saw my uncles were also alcoholics, too. So so but I learned how to pair alcohol and wine. And so I could, you know, drink it and learn how to, you know, cook with wine. And and um, so I came home and um, afterwards I, I interned with some wonderful chefs and um um, but that was not the life for me. It was, um, I, I knew I wanted to be a mom someday and that life is a life of a lot of long hours. And I knew I wanted to be a mom where I could be home and you don't come home until late at night. And there's also a lot of drugs and alcohol, <laughs> um, in the restaurant business. And, um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I didn't know what, I, what was I going to do? So, the only thing I knew how to do was, um, well, shoot, I know how to school, so I'll go to school again. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, so I'll go to grad school. 
it was either to go to law school or med school. My dad thought I would always be an attorney because I love to argue. He always used to line us up for our punishments. What do you think you did wrong? And what do you think you deserve um, for your punishment? And I would also always talk forever and talk to him about how it's child abuse and blah, 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 you know, and go on. And so, and my brother would say, I'll take five lick-ins or whatever. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, I didn't get spanked. He did. But, and he finally, I finally told, I'm like, hey, buddy, just, he's like, whatever she says. So anyway, my dad thought I should be an attorney. So sure enough, I decided I'm going to go to medical school. Mm, so I'm not going to go there. So I go and I'm trying to figure out where to go. And I'm in the hallway and um, this guy comes in. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be the next day. And he's like, oh, come on in and we can sit and talk. And little did I know that's the dean. And he said, how long do you want to have you wanted to be a doctor? And I said, never. <laughs> he's like, well, that's interesting. Um, so um, and we talked about, yes, art and music and politics and and cooking and all kinds of things. And he said, well, why do you think you would be good at this? I'm like, well. You know, I like people. I'm I when I set my mind to something, I do it and I do it well. And um, I think I could be good at this. Um, and so and I think it's a good way to make some money and have a family. He's like, OK. He's like, well, if you want to come, then you're in. I said, well, I think I have to go to the interview first. He's like, ah, you're in. <laughs> so I found out the next day who he was. So um, in medical school, that's where I met uh, my husband. Um, first day of medical school, he came up to me and he said, oh, I hear you're my competition. I'm like, who's this ass? I'm like, uh, I'm not here to compete with you, right? You know, um, he's like, oh no, you're here to compete. You're you're the, you're the one to beat. I'm like, what the heck? You know, I'm just here to do my thing, just whatever. Well, um, med students and law students live together, and he used to follow me around. Oh God, until, you know, he's like, if you just go out with me, then I will leave you alone. Well. I did go out with him and he was tall, dark and handsome and, you know, and he was very, very smart and he was interesting. Um, and so we kind of had a whirlwind relationship and, um, you know, um, got married in less than a year. And um, in hindsight, um, to those of you who are thinking about that, um, you know, there are some important questions to ask um, about people. Ask a little bit more. You know, don't go with the tar tall, dark and handsome um, um, or smart. Ask the family history. Um, his family on his side of the family, strong history of addiction. His dad um, lost. He was a judge, lost his license um, for um, sexual improprieties. Um, he sexually molested his um, sons, including my husband. Um, lots of other mental illness um, in the family. So it also exists on my side too, don't get me wrong. But anyway, healthy should breed healthy or at least attract healthy. Um, and I don't know that I was necessarily healthy. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But anyway, I did marry him and um, we were very busy and um, we worked very hard. Um, I didn't drink anywhere through high school, med school, college, even residency. Um, we were too busy. We're too busy doing our thing. Um, so, um, when it came time to decide what we were going to do, um, after we finished, um, I thought I wanted to go into pediatrics and my parents were like, what is that? You play with children? I'm like, no, that's actually a career. Um, so, um, he wanted to be a heart surgeon. He's always wanted to be a heart surgeon. And so, um, and my mom's like, oh, that's kind of a nice career. I'm like, okay, I'll be a surgeon. Okay. Do things for yourself. Don't do things for other people. Right. Um, I did, I went into surgery. I did surgery for, um, three years or surgery residency and, um, ended up, we fought in the OR all the time. It was not good. And, uh, um, I went to the chairman and said, Hey, I got to leave. You know, we're going to get divorced. He's like, Oh, no, no big deal. Um, I'm on my third marriage. And I'm like, that's not what I mean. But anyway, um, so, um, I, after that, um, we, you know, we were married for a while. It took us a while to get pregnant, um, went through infertility treatments and ended up having twins. I had a terrible pregnancy, had hyperemesis, lost 75 pounds my, with that pregnancy. My boys were born at um, um, 24 weeks and they were um, two pounds um, each. And so um, he came to the NICU once, looked at them, walked away, and he didn't speak to me for four months. He blamed me for um, for them being born premature, and um, he just became a workaholic, um, and um, I was left to to do this on my own. Um, 
so I spent a lot of time raising these kids. When my son was two, he wasn't speaking. His twin brother was talking up a sword and running around. And, and so we went to a psychiatrist to try to figure out what was going on. And he said, uh, you know, your ki kid's got autism spectrum. And he also had a lot of behavioral issues. Um, and so um, he said, your son's going to be in an institution someday, you know, and um, and put him on two SSRIs and an antipsychotic. And he's like, it just is what it is, lady. You got to accept it. I'm like, well, you don't know me, you know, so I'm going to do what I got to do. And so um, I, um, you know, uh, took him to every therapy I knew still the behavior problems to get better. So I'm like, OK, well, then I'll go back to residency. I'll learn about psychiatry. <laughs> so I did that, too. And so raising them. I mean, it was hard, but the one thing was um, I had to be in control because over time I was getting tired. And as I got more tired, I got more irritable. And what I learned about my husband, he was a malignant narcissist. And if you know anything about narcissists, they're very kind to you if you feed their ego. If you don't, then they are mean. And he, it went from yelling and screaming to um, pushing, to punching, to picking me up, choking me, knife up to the throat, all the while my children watching this, being terrorized. Um, and, but, you know, and of course, and it's like, if you, if you tell anybody, then I will kill you. And he was so unhinged. I knew he had the potential to do that. You know, people always ask, well, why don't you just leave? It's not that easy. Hmm. Right. Um, I stayed with the man for 18 years. Um, you know, and the other thing too, is I couldn't leave him. Because if you leave them, then I could, I would, he would have to have some time with them. And there was no way in hell I was going to have that to happen. So um, on our 18 year anniversary, we went out to dinner and he said, um, oh, honey, by the way, I'm dating. I'm like, excuse me, married people don't date. Um, kind of bizarre. Um, you know, he wasn't dating. He was seeing lots of people and he had, um, he also had a sex addiction, you know, like his dad, he, um, he would come home after work and he would lock himself indoors and he would in, behind and lots of pornography and, and he hired high price hookers. That's uh, all that stuff. All to say, you know, I'm like, look, this is craziness. Um, and my eight year old son came to me and said, mom, we deserve better and we need to leave. So I, um, I told my parents, um, about what was going on and, um, we, um, and she helped me to try to get away from him. And it took a lot of time and a lot of money to do that. Because, um, you know, when you got money, they can hire very high power attorneys. And so um, after three years, we got divorced. And on the day that I gave him the papers, he tried to commit suicide. He um, drove his car, sports car, 100 miles an hour and took a straight 90 degree turn, flew off the freeway. A trucker found him and um, he... Um, he um, also tried to slit his carotid. <clears throat> so he didn't remember me filing for divorce, you know, and so there was more things that happened, you know. But anyway, through all of this, I was like, well, you know, I said, I, I am leaving you and I'm not coming back. Well, there was a lady who lived across the street and she and I became good friends and she was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, we, she was supportive of me and, um, we did a lot of things together and I started to drink socially and it was, it was fine. It was fun. We did a lot of fun things. I didn't do a lot of fun things in my marriage. It was terrifying. Okay. And so this was totally different. I'm like, ha, huh, I like this. Um, but we, you know, I eventually knew that I needed to leave and I got full custody of my kids and, um, the way I got full custody was um, we were fighting back and forth and he um, he said, how much to get rid of that? And I'm like, you mean our children? I'm like, zero dollars. Take it all. You know, just give me them and um, give me my kids and I want and and allow me to leave. I also couldn't visit my family. Um, I was not allowed to leave the state of Idaho. <clears throat> Because it would interfere with his visitation rights. Um, he would have to come with me. So um, I got full custody. I had to go back to court three times to make sure that I understood how much money I was giving up. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I did. I left with the clothes on my back and three suitcases of my children. And I came to North Carolina and um, I um, had the opportunity to interview for a job to be chairman of the department at Novant. And I thought, finally, life is going to begin. It's all going to be great. And um, start a new life over. He could not have contact with him. 
you know, at all. I got to change their name, everything. On the day of my interview, um, I got phone calls. My sister was ringing the phone off the hook. I thought, you know, Emily or Amy, I'm like, stop calling me. And I'm interviewing. She knew it. Is But we were going to celebrate her birthday and my nephew's birthday um, after the interview. Um, he was turning 21 and um, they had shared the same birthday. And so we were excited. I thought she was just excited and had some details. She got on the phone and um, <clears throat> she said that um, my nephew had been killed by a drunk driver um, that morning. And um, he was killed by one of his fraternity brothers. He was uh, walking home and um, his uh, fraternity brother picked him up, gave him a ride. And um, <clears throat> he lost control of the car and went smack into a tree. This was his fourth year why he was 20 years old. So I uh, said, I'll come down. She said, no, stay there you know, get the job. And I did. I don't remember that day at all. Um, I didn't drink. I knew when I started that job that I had to be in control. Here you go. I've got three kids. I've got to protect them. And now I've got to help my sister, you know? And, um, so I didn't drink. I, I, from, but that job was really hard and I work long hours. And, um, when you're chairman, you're kind of everything, you know, you're the chief, but you're also the lady, you do everything. And it's, so I would leave the house at seven o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't come home until nine o'clock at night. And I was exhausted. And, you know, over time, you know, um, I said, Hey, I'll have myself a glass of wine. You know, I would cook with wine. I was cooking meals for my children. Um, and I'd go to, um, clubs, you know, book clubs, nobody ever read the book. We just drank wine, you know? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, um, that slowly progressed. And then my mom got diagnosed with cancer and, um, I, um, you know, um, and my whole world fell apart. You know, um, this is the one woman, my, my mom had retired. Um, she, she actually retired to help me get free from my ex. And she's the one that, um, put up all the money and got me here, got me in the house. And my mom and I actually came to, I told, told her what it meant all those times when she didn't come. She celebrated each and every one of those milestones with me and threw a party, you know, and we became like, like inseparable. And when she was dying, I was like, there isn't something, there's not a school I can go to that's going to fix this. And I couldn't sleep and I was sad. And one glass of wine turned into two glasses of wine, which turned into the full bottle. And eventually what ended up happening is my world switched from coming home and cooking dinner with my kids and being involved with my kids. That's what I wanted is it became the same thing again is I would come home. I'm like, help me bring things in. It was groceries, wine. I would go in my room and I would drink mm -hmm. and I'd lock the door because I didn't want them to see me drinking. And, um, so my kids were left with them just being out there on their own. They're in middle school, you know, through middle school and high school. So, but they were used to it. You know, they said, they're like, you know, uh, we kind of, we kind of hid with dad. Now we're hiding with her. They would talk to me through the door, but they realized that it was better for me to be behind that door. Because when I came out of that door, I was not a nice person. I, Everything was going wrong in my job. You know, I was tired. Why are you complaining? Everything was negative and, and I'd lash at them. And if you yell at me or you do something, you un how dare you be ungrateful? And it got to a point to where I kicked my son out. I said, you don't like it here? Leave, go. My son did. He moved out and um, he was in high school and he moved out. And now there's the two of them and they're like, now what? I got a mom who... You know, is not present. Um, I don't have anybody. My son's now going off and he's like 17, doesn't know what to do. Well, he figures out, you know, he moves in with some people who are drinking. My son's got the same thing as I do. And my son started drinking, he started selling drugs and um, to make ends meet. And so, um, yeah, so anyway, um, you know, um, it just kept getting worse and worse. And as I kept drinking, um, I would get sick and I get dehydrated and I'd have to go to the hospital and my liver functions test started going up and, um, you know, I'd make 
excuses for it. I'm not an alcoholic. Huh? My gosh, I drink expensive wine. You're not an alcoholic, you know? Do you know how much I spend per bottle? You know, <laughs> whatever. Um, they knew these were my these were my colleagues. These ER docs. I knew these people. Um, but it didn't stop me. I lost my job because they smelled alcohol on me. You know, and um, but that's okay. I went into private practice. Didn't stop me from drinking. When I went into private practice, my office manager, she figured out pretty quickly that I was drinking. She embezzled a lot of funds from me. <laughs> so um, how did I know? But what my kids started to know was that um, I was forgetting things, forgetting to pick them up, forgetting to pay the bills. Police are showing up because I didn't pay the mortgage. Oh, we're going into foreclosure. Um, I was restless, irritable, and discontent all the time. And it got to a day to where I'll never forget, I just, um, my kids, I was taking ambulances to the hospital and my kids were like, mom, you're going to die. You're going to die. And when I was in the hospital, the guy's like, do you want to die? I'm like, no, I don't. He's like, well, you're doing a good job of it. You're trying to kill yourself. I'm like, I'm not trying to kill myself. He's like, yeah, you are. You will die. I had stage four cirrhosis. And, um, I, uh, my liver was already shot. Mm, um, and um, I remember pulling one day, I just um, pulled myself up to the mirror. I'm like, I don't know who I am anymore. I didn't recognize that woman. I got to my knees and I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> Please, Lord, help me. I, I can't do this on my own. I've tried my whole life to fill this hole. And the only person who can fill it is you. And um, in the answer to that prayer, and I reported myself to the board <laughs> And I said, I got a drinking problem and I got to go to rehab. And they said, well, they said I had to go to rehab too. <laughs> so I went to Pavilion. And when I was there, um, I had Candace and she was, um, oh my gosh, she was so hard on me. And, you know, and, um, and she's like, don't boohoo with me. You know, she's like, we got stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you got issues too. And I mean, but she was firm, but loving. And that's what I needed. Um, and um, I'll be honest, I, I was sitting there. I'm like, I don't know. I, what in the world am I doing here? You know, I know I could give those lectures. I'm like, no, I can't. No, I can't. Those people that work at Pavilion, they are experts in what they do and listen to them. I was so pigheaded. There's a reason why I was in IOP for six months. <laughs> you know, um, I ended up not going to EC because I was so ill. I had to come back. Um, and I got on the transplant list, but you can't get a liver until you're um, a year sober. So I um, got on the transplant list um, after a year of sobriety. And just, um, and I stayed sober and I got a sponsor and I was got a home group, my winter camp group. And, um, I, um, was, you know, doing the steps and my life turned around. Oh my gosh. I got my children back. Um, I didn't, I, um, you know, they're like, they're, they were happy to see me outside of that door. They weren't talking through the door anymore. Um, they're like, this is the mom I know. Um, and, um, but, you know, but they knew that I had stage four cirrhosis and I had to talk to my children about death. And I said, I'm going to, I hope I get one, but if I don't, you need to be prepared. <laughs> and so, you know, try to live your whole life in a short time period. <laughs> Not possible, but I did the best that I could, you know, and I'm like, okay, but what I did was be present for them. Every single moment, <laughs> listen to them. Um, everything was so beautiful, you know. Um, all that silly stuff I used to worry about all the time. <laughs> I didn't care, you know. Care like what people think about me. Whatever, you know. That's you. That's your opinion. I didn't. I live for me, and I live for my kids. You know, and my sponsor said, you got to get sober for you, not just for your kids. You got to be sober for yourself, you know, and I learned to play piano again. I learned to sing. My kids are like, mom, they didn't know I could sing. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you have a beautiful voice. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, so um, but my health continued to fail and I got ascites and I look like I was having quadruplets and. I had to be tapped three times a week for my um, for my uh, sides in my stomach, and then it fluid filled up in my lung, and it would push my left lung. And you want to talk about air hunger? Let me tell you guys, this disease will kill you <laughs> if you continue. And they talk about the elevator, and you can get off anytime you want. Well, mine went all the way to the bottom. And that air hunger, 
you can't catch your breath when your diaphragm can't move because you're so full of, you know, fluid. And I would just pray to God, help me have one breath. <laughs> Don't let my kids see me like this. Well, anyway, I went into the hospital and um, as I got transported again to tap things off and um, I came home and a couple days later, my kids found me in the bathroom and um, I wasn't making sense. I was gibberish and my um, levels went really high. I was encephalopathic. And um, by the time I got to the hospital, I was already in a hepatic coma. So my kids um, saw me on a ventilator and, um, you know, they said, you know, she doesn't get a liver here. And really the next 48 hours, 48, 72 hours, you know, we're going to have to let your mom go. <laughs> so my kids and my dad went to Statesville and they bought me a casket and a tombstone. And I got my name on a tombstone somewhere. Well, I do know in Statesville and um, they prepared. And um, my dad, when he was coming back from Statesville um, to have a conversation with them again, he pulled over on the side of 77 and he got on his knees and he said a prayer. He said, Lord, I need a miracle. Um, you know, I need a liver for my daughter. He's like, I know you're a big God. He's like, you protected my daughter through so many different things. You, um, I asked this, could you please? Um, my ex-husband actually um, committed suicide the year before. And um, so they would have been, they didn't have a dad anyway. And now they would have lost two parents. And my, my father was like, you can't do this. You can't. So um, he got back to the hospital and um, at about seven o'clock at night and um, at two o'clock in the morning, got a phone call that um, they had um, a young kid who was in a motorcycle accident and um, they didn't know if it was a match, but obviously I'm at the top of the list because I'm in a coma and I'm there. And we won't know until we get to the OR and we're going to take her down and say goodbye. And so my children had to say goodbye. And they're like, if it's not, then we're going to let her go. And so I got my last rights and my kids said their goodbyes to me. And, um, and um, then, um, you know, they got the phone call that it was a match. <laughs> Obviously, I'm here, <laughs> you know, so... Um, when I went in, I didn't know my children. I didn't know my own name. I didn't know anything, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I was in the ICU for like a week and whatnot. And, you know, and after I got to the step down, my kids came and saw me. And I'm saying, I'm like, hey, how are you? And they like almost fell on the floor. They're like, mom, you didn't know who we were. You didn't know any of this. And um, and so I will tell you that, um, man, alive, there isn't a day that I don't think that family for the gift that they gave me a chance at a second life. Um, but my life today is beyond my wildest ex dreams. Honestly, um, I have um, an amazing home group. Um, my The winter camp group I've gone to from Pavilion here, I've gone to it since I got sober. Um, these, these are, this is my family. Um, and we, it's crosstalk, which is what I love, you know, and we do life together. Um, I have a wonderful Caduceus group, um, professional group. We do crosstalk as well. And I love them dearly. And we can talk, there's some things you can't talk about within, you, know, you have to talk about within your profession. Um, it would terrify you guys sometimes, probably. Um, not terrified, but you know what I mean. It's just um, shop talk. But anyway, um, I start my day with prayer meditation. Um, I go for walks. I, I try to do my walk. I walk and pray at the same time. So I walk praying out loud down the street. My neighbors think I'm schizophrenic. I don't care because I talk out loud, you know, and I'm praying to God, you know. And when I come back on the way back, I'm silent because I talk a lot. I'm paid to talk, you know, um, and I've got to learn to listen to, I've got to listen to what God has to say to me. And that walking back, I do hear his voice. I hear, you know what that hole is in my heart? You know, what fills that up is him. <laughs> and then by me having a relationship and putting all those stressors in life on his shelf, I'm like, I'm flattered and all, you know, I'm going to do the best that I can do, but then I'm going to put the rest on your shelf and I'm going to enjoy today 
and today only, and I'm going to enjoy my children and I'm going to be grateful and I'm going to see you at work and I'm going to try to be nice to people and recognize that everybody has their own stuff. That lady at the checkout line, you know, with the coupons, she's not there to piss me off, you know, and make my day hell, you know, it's like, who knows, whatever, you know, um, but to really work the steps, getting sober is the first part, but working the steps, what a blessing to be able to learn about me and why I do what I do and to learn those patterns so I don't repeat them and to have my children walk through this. My my son is in recovery too now and um, and we talk about it openly. We go to IDAA meetings for doctors and dentists and their children um, and um, I just... Gosh, you know, Pavilion was, is a very spiritual place. I've been back there. Um, and I remember going for walks around the lake and I'm like, God was there, you know, um, he's always been there for me. Um, so anyway, um, I am so grateful and, um, I can't say that every day has been easy. It's not, I've also had to deal with, you know, hard things. Um, but I take them a day at a time and I have a plan. Um, I used to do my taxes based on what I wanted to pay the government, okay, and then work backwards. So now I'm on a payment plan, you know, but, you know, I went and I explained it. You know, I used to worry about, you know, all those things, you know, taking bills, just throw them in the drawer. They don't exist, right? Um, no, I pay my bills now. <laughs> you know, I actually pay them ahead. Um, I actually, my my mortgage is paid always ahead by two months, Um and um, I go to work and I love, love my job, you know, and I am so blessed my families and my families knew I was an alcoholic and families still came back to me. I'm amazed. Um, but I've gotten even more and um, I, I can't even tell you what a difference it is for me today um, from then. Um, so thank you for letting me share um, and um, open it up to for questions. And hopefully there's something that I said that resonates or may be helpful to some of you. Thank you.